Good afternoon and welcome to the Public Services Committee meeting. The meeting will start in 60 seconds. Good evening. Uh, we'll call this public services meeting to order. Tonight is Tuesday, June 20th. Um, approval of the minutes from our meeting dated February 14th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with our first item uh, this evening, uh, revisions to the animal control ordinances. Um, Keith and Julie. Whoever wants to present, go for it. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Julie DeYoung. I'm the Animal Control Supervisor with the City of Sioux Falls. And I'd start, like to start by thanking the committee for letting us discuss these um, proposals. Um, and I'll open it up for any questions after we go through the presentation. Thank you. So I started with animal control about two years ago now. And as we've been working through me learning the ordinances and then as cases come in, we see where there's um, deficiencies in some of the, the ordinances. And last January, I was able to meet with a bunch of animal control uh, officers from around the country in some training, and we were able to discuss our different ordinances. And so I spoke a lot with uh, Springfield, Missouri, with their staff, which is a relatively similar sized city, uh, the third largest in Missouri. And so we looked at their ordinances and some of the revisions that we are proposing tonight are from kind of guided by what they had. So the first change that we would like to make is to the cruelty to animals ordinance. Basically it's just cleaning up language and making it uh, easier for people to understand, and we're matching the cruelty definition to that of the state law. State law does define mistreat, neglect, and cruelty, um, and but it does not uh, define maltreat. So maltreat um, needed just to be removed anyway. The second is the running at large ordinance. What we'd like to do here is we are proposing to add a subsection that would allow us to charge a higher fine to people <coughs> that have their dog running at large more than, so three times or more in a 12 month period. It adds an extra penalty for repeat offenders, um, which repeat offenders, we spend more of our animal control officer time, uh, the city energy and um, tax dollars on. So it'd be nice if we could um, reduce the number of running at large incidents that we have each year. In 2016, we had 278 leash law violations and 2,322 stray dog calls. So if we could cut that number down, uh, I think that this might help. Will you say that stat one more time? I'm sorry. We had 278 uh, leash law violation calls. Basically those are when an officer actually sees somebody with their dog off leash. Um, the other ones, were there was 2,322 stray dog calls. Thank you. And some of those are, uh, as soon as they pick the dog up, they know that it's a repeat offender. They've seen it multiple times in the same neighborhood. The next uh, thing that we'd like to revise is the vicious, vicious animal ordinance. 
Um, basically, with the vicious animal as we have it now, if an animal is deemed vicious, there are certain restrictions that the owner would have to comply with in order to get the dog back home. And if they comply with everything, they can bring the dog back home. Um, in some cases, we have been concerned about sending dogs back home because they are so aggressive and the attacks that they have inflicted have been pretty serious. And so we would like to add another, a more severe penalty for animals that are deemed vicious. And we'll discuss that later on. So basically with this, we just wanna change the name from vicious to restricted because it'll be all the same. It, the animal will go home, but it'll have restrictions on it. So restriction, restricted is a pretty good term for that category. We have had a couple inc incidents lately um, since I started where people have moved dogs that have been declared vicious in other cities. They've moved those into Sioux Falls. And then we are stuck with the decision of how do we declare the animal vicious if it hasn't attacked an animal here in the city. So what we'd like to do to, is to have the same restrictions on a dog that's been declared somewhere else um, in our city. So in this circumstance, if, um, if a dog was declared vicious and it didn't, uh, declared vicious say in Parker, and it didn't match our um, standards, then we wouldn't declare it restricted in or vicious in Sioux Falls. But if it did meet the, the things that we look at in our ordinances to say it's a restricted or a vicious animal, then we would also declare it a restricted or vicious in Sioux Falls in order to have those safeguards in place for the, for the public. We'd also like to have a universal sign um, this is just a mock-up. I stole the picture off the internet for now. We, we're not, we haven't printed any yet. Um, but we'd like a sign um, for people that either can't read English or for children. So if somebody walks up to the, a door or a dog's kennel, that they can see that this is a dog that may bite. But it also tells people like postmen or the FedEx person, whoever comes up to the door, that this dog does have some restrictions and it can't just be running around um, without a muzzle or, or a leash on. Many people have the beware of dog signs in their, in their windows. Some people have those and they don't even have dogs. They just wanna scare people off, you know, and show that they have some sort of a security system. And then the main component of what we wanna change with this ordinance is to add the vicious animal subsection. So I don't, I don't know if you want me to read all these or not, but basically if an animal um, causes the death of another animal or a person, it would be declared vicious. Uh, if it had a bite or multiple bites at a level four or higher on the Dunbar scale, which I'll talk about on the next slide, it would be declared vicious. Um, if it's been declared vicious under these same circumstances um, in another jurisdiction, then we would also declare it vicious. Um, but a person that we could not declare a dog vicious if, it, if the person, say, broke into my house and my dog attacked that person in a vicious manner, we couldn't, they couldn't deem that dog vicious um, because it was pr protecting its own territory and its home. Um, or if the animal is being teased or tormented or somebody is pushing the animal towards some sort of an attack. What would change with this vicious animal declaration then would, that, would be that nobody could possess a vicious animal and that the animal would have to be euthanized. We would also want that anybody, any animal that's been declared vicious was, would also be deemed restricted for the purposes of the administrative appeal hearing. So that if we declared a dog vicious and the appeal hearing officers decided, nope, it's not vicious, it doesn't meet those criteria, it would still fall under the restricted dog categories where it would still have some restrictions upon it and we wouldn't have to go through the appeal, appeal process again. 
So the Dunbar scale is what we want to um, we want to use for determining whether a bite is restricted or vicious. Um, and this does follow other ordinances in other cities. So what we'd like to do is anything with a level four or higher, we would, as I said before, we would want to deem those as a vicious animal. So I'll start at the lower part of the Dunbar scale. The level one is just an obnoxious or aggressive behavior, but no skin contact. The second is skin contact, but you know, there's really no skin puncture. Um, the dog bit maybe to scare somebody off or something like that. Um, level three uh, is one to four punctures from a single bite. Um, again, uh, there might be some lacerations, but that's just from you know the victim pulling their hand away or a pet owner pulling a dog away, that sort of thing. Um, a level four would be the more serious bites. So you have one to four punctures from a single bite with at least one puncture deeper than half the length of the dog's canine tooth. Uh, there might also be deep bruising and lacerations, and there might be some indication that the dog bit and then shook the animal or the victim in some way, which shows a, a higher aggression level than just a bite. And then level five, uh, much it's a multiple level four bites, and level six is the victim is dead. So Dr. Ian Dunbar came up with this. He's a world-renowned veterinarian, animal behaviorist, and many municipalities use the Dunbar scale for um, an objective me measurement of severity of bites. So it's rather than us saying, well, that looks like a really bad bite, we can now look at this and say, well, it meets this criteria or it doesn't. Moving on to the next. Um, <clears throat> Stray animals can be uh, a danger to the community. Um, if you're feeding stray animals, you could come in contact with them. Uh, they could bite or scratch, and then they could cause, or cause you to get a disease like rabies. People harboring stray animals, it's already not allowed, but sometimes it's hard to catch. Um, we would like to add an addendum here for people that are feeding stray animals. Because the more stray animals you get in one spot, the higher incidence you're gonna have of, of somebody getting bit or somebody scratched or the animals fighting. Um, what is also an issue with putting cat food or dog food out for stray animals is that you attract wildlife, such as raccoons, coyotes, possums, and then you're just causing more trouble for yourself and your neighbors as you're drawing in those other animals. The next ordinance uh, change is keeping of animals. Basically, we just, um, if you look at D, it says that um, there's prohibitions against owning fur bearers, bears, mountain lions, bobcats, that kind of thing in the city. Um, basically, we just want to add H so that it allows the Great Plains Zoo to have these animals because there wasn't really anything in there before about that. And then, Enforcement, we have found also that there are certain animal calls in the parks that we aren't able to enforce. And the police department is very busy also and they can't find the time either to come and to uh, um, enforce some of these ordinances. So we'd like to be able to, we are in the parks anyway a lot of the time, we'd like to be able to enforce some of them. The first one is Parks Ordinance 95.013, and that basically says people shouldn't be harassing or hurting animals in the parks. Um, 95.014, people shouldn't be feeding or keeping waterfowl. Again, something that fits in with animal controls um, genre. 95.015, trapping is prohibited in the parks. Again, an animal control issue. And then 95.032 is the authority of the parks director to prohibit certain conduct. So there's certain areas in town that have special rules deemed in the parks for certain events. Um, one example is Arrowhead Park. If you go to Arrowhead Park, you can feed the geese, but you can't walk your dog, even if it's on a leash. There's restrictions out there. So people will call us and want us to do something about the people walking dogs at Arrowhead, but we can't at this point. Um, we can't enforce that decision by the Parks Department. This would allow us to do that. 
Also, um, like uh, events such as Jazz Fest, where there's no dogs allowed in the event, again, animal control would then be able to come and enforce that, uh, that part of it. And then 90.017 is an exemption for police dogs. This just exempts them from the provisions of this chapter as far as um, bites and that kind of thing. It's a common uh, exemption that's found in other cities. That's all I have for those. Does anybody have any questions about those? Thank, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll open it up to anybody in the audience that would like to speak or say anything. And I know I have a, a couple of questions written down as well. Um, and so we'll take any input from anyone. If you'd like, please come up to the um, dice and um, state your name. And I'm Carol Flower. And uh, I grew up in Sioux Falls and moved away to go to school. And I've been back for the past 20 years. We are a dog family. We have dogs, we love our dogs, and they are part of our family. They are like our children, even though we have adult children. And so uh, they are very important to us. Uh, during the time we've got our, our dogs, it's, we've got our dogs late in life, and so over the past 20 years, we've had eight dogs. We now have three, two of them are about seven years old. We don't know because they're all rescue dogs. Um, we have one who is 18 and a half on her way to, to be 19, which is pretty amazing. And even though she was our fourth dog, she has been with every single dog that we've owned and she has seen and lived with every one of them, which I think is astonishing. During the 20 years, we have encountered loose dogs in Sioux Falls. And for us, they've kind of fallen into two categories. One category are dogs who have escaped. They've escaped their yards. They've escaped where they live. And they are just happy to be out, just free. And uh, I mean, what we have done in the past, if my husband and I have seen a dog, we try to, to capture it. Uh, put a leash on it, try to rain, try to get a hold of the, the owners. We've never encountered any, any um, bad dogs, any vicious dogs in, in this. Um, probably the, the funniest one was a, a dog that was prancing along the sidewalk, dragging behind him one of those, those metal circular corkscrew type devices. At the end of his, his, his leash, he was just perfectly happy to be out just on his own. We lost one of our little dogs, who somebody opened the gate when she was out there. She's a little tiny 13 year old and she was gone just like that and ended up walking down the middle of 22nd Street with cars going past her like this. And uh, thank God there was a lady there who stopped traffic until she was captured and she, she had tags and she has issued microchips so we, we got her back in short term. So we've encountered dogs that have somehow escaped. These are well-behaved dogs generally. These are dogs that come from families who love them and just for whatever reason they escaped and, and they're happy to have their dogs back. On the other hand, we've also encountered dogs that have been in their yard with their owners and who have left their yard, left their owners, and come to us for whatever reason, whether to attack us, whether just to see, meet and greet our dogs who are on leashes. Um, but it's a scary thing because you do not know how another dog is going to behave. You don't know how your dog is going to behave in a situation like this. And, and it just about every instance that this has happened over the past 20 years, an owner has had to, to intervene, come over and try and get their dog back. Um, there's only one instance where the dog was actually under the control of its owner and actually stayed in its yard. Every other time the dog left its, its yard, left its owner, was running free. And in one case, there, there was a dog that as we were walking down one side of the street, the dog was with his family on the other side of the street 
and the dog left, ran over to us, and of course, I, I'll start screaming and pick my little dogs up and stay, you know, I'll, I'll try to defer that dog. And the, and the mother came over to, to try and get the dog back. And one of the, the really scary things about this was that when the mother left her yard, her little toddler started following her. And the little toddler was about to take a step into the, the road itself. And if there had been a car coming, that nobody would have seen that little toddler. So very often owners think that they have control over their dogs when in fact they do not. And very often they do not see what possible consequences can result from having their dog. And if anything, I would like to see Sioux Falls have something in the ordinance where, whereby dogs cannot be in their front yards unless they are restrained in some way because you, you don't know what a dog is going to do. I would like to see that happen. I also <clears throat> would really like to see if, if there's any way that, that we in Sioux Falls, I would like to see in the state of South Dakota have some laws prohibiting um, puppy mills. These are usually terrible situations in the state of, Mon state of Missouri, which the officer was referring to is one of the, the worst offenders in, in the kind of abuse that happens to dogs that are in these puppy mills. The, 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 the abuse is just sometimes absolutely horrific. And when we were involved with a rescue group um, in the breed that we had, um, they actually got a little dog in their system one time and they it couldn't walk and they x-rayed it and it, entire limb was just nothing but it was crushed. The bones were just crushed and they were just nothing but little slivers. And that little dog had to endure incredible pain, not getting any kind of help. So in addition to maybe doing things for the city, um, I think we, we need to take some kind of a stand that has to do with, with puppy mills and, and the, the way they treat their dogs. The, and just ban them if we can, just I'll not even allow them if possible. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you. We thank love you, our Carol. dogs. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? If you would please state your name and um, anything that you'd like to um, address in regards to the presentation we heard earlier. Hi, good evening. My name is Corey Beatty. I'm the Sioux Falls Area Humane Society Executive Director. I just wanted to lend our support to these ordinance changes um, for the city. Um, we do take care of all the counties outside the city of Sioux Falls, and the Dunbar Bite Scale is very well renowned. It is extremely a good. I mean, it's a very good scale to determine bites. Um, I think it's used pretty much everywhere um, around here, at least, and uh, we use it in all of our counties also. So, just wanted to lend our support. Uh, we hope that these ordinances can be changed. We think it's going to be you know, make our city better as far as being animal owners and also being able to um, enforce the opportunity for people to be good dog owners or good cat owners and make sure that they are being responsible with their pets. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You. Is there anyone else? Okay. Please step up. Liz Meilenberg, and I've had dogs all my life, all my life, and I had two that lived to age 17 as well, and, and one 16, etc. I was upset with the article in the paper today about so-called menace pets and decided, and the desire of some in the city to want more control over the ability to seize and kill these animals. I think the current requirements are quite stringent and expensive for owners. That is to maintain at least $100,000 or more worth of liability on the animal and keeping it muzzled. That is not cheap. If those directions are not followed, then the F's, the Sioux Falls area uh, animal control can seize the animal and kill it. Bluntly stated, there are many people who act stupidly around animals and there are animals who have stupid owners. Animals respond to love just as humans. They need to be trained. That is the owner's responsibility. Behavior is not the animal's fault. Often these animals have been mistreated or beaten. 
so come down on the owner, but harder than the current statute. I suggest you strengthen the current law by requiring four-foot fencing if, if a dog is an offender. Additionally, the owner should be required to take his dog to behavior training classes, which includes owner education and instruction on how to treat an animal with kindness. Furthermore, a penitentiary retraining program for menace animals could be started through, an animal, through animal control and overseen by the Humane Society. But just to seize an animal for kill without a chance for rehabilitation is equally as ruthless and places all the blame on the animal and not the owner who is the one responsible. People who mistreat or beat animals usually display the same bully behavior towards other human beings. I strongly submit that the menace animal problem is in reality a human behavior problem that needs to be addressed. This is where the problem begins and is allowed to grow and fester. World-renowned canine behaviorist, Dr. Nicholson, Nichols, Nicholas Dodman, Tufts University, Dr. James Serple, PhD, University of Pennsylvania, believe that a dog's unacceptable behavior or misbehavior is quite possibly a direct result of their human's emotional and psychological state. And this study is to be released early 2017. Lastly, I want to introduce to you my gentle, little, well-trained poodle named Ollie, who was dumped in the country by someone I will call a sub-low life human being. Ollie has never been vicious, but his former owner certainly was vicious. Ollie's pelvis was broken and he was left to die. Luckily, a kind person came along and rescued him and turned him into the local humane society where he was cared for and healed. Praise the Lord for kind, caring people. Thank you, Liz. Anyone this else? This is my Ollie. Anyone else that would like to address the council? Um, I'll turn it back over to Public Service Committee. Are there any questions? Councilor Selberg. Thank you, Councilor Erickson. I have a quick question for Julie. Sure. Thank you for the presentation. Have we had a level six on the Dunbar scale, if I'm reading this correct, like you thought we were talking about different things that can happen and the punishment for that, have we had it? We have had dogs killed by other dogs, yes. Oh, it's dogs by other, yes. okay, okay. So a victim can be a dog. Okay, that's the part I was maybe leaning into that. I wondered if we'd had something that I didn't remember. And then yeah. the vicious animal section, I'm not sure if I picked this up, they just set this in front of me, but I remembered you saying something about the vicious animals, the new section where they're euthanized, no questions or appeals. Have there been a lot of issues in no, the there past? No, there would be an appeal. Would be, Yep, okay. there still would be an appeal to an uh, appeal hearing, yep. Has there been a lot of issues with that in the recent past too, or there's been animal behavior, but there's been a lot of appeals or questions whether they should be euthanized or not, or is, I mean, is it gone quite a bit? Uh, I guess, could you clarify the question a little bit more? Well, we're making it more strict the way I understand it? Correct. Okay. So, so there are some circumstances where the people have complied with the vicious dog ordinance as it stands now, okay. um, but we're just fearful that an accident could happen with those dogs um, escaping out of the house um, if they're unattended or not attended correctly, um, that an incident could happen. That's kind of where I was going. Did an animal maybe commit a certain act and a then... A further act. A further act no, and then, okay. Not yet, thankfully. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Councilor Staley? Yes, I have several questions. Um, okay, first of all, let's go back to the leash law. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you are if you walk around with holding the leash, the dog's running ahead of you, as a guy did past my house last night. He, You see him, he's going to get fined $95, correct? If the animal control officer sees that. Right. They have that. Okay, $95. I, I, had, I had a hard time realizing or imagining that someone is getting fined several times a year you're t how many people are actually getting a multiple $95 fine t tell me I can't give you an exact number I could say we probably have repeat offenders maybe 15 to 20 
So some people are spending up to like $300 a year in fines? Yes. Really? Yes, and we often find that these people don't have their dogs up to date on rabies and city license also, so those are also more fines that they can get at the same time. So are these people actually paying the fines or are they just uh, the fines are accruing? I guess I don't follow up on the... That's a whole other yep. issue is how you collect those, those right. fines. So, okay, so we're talking... Um, the third time you're going to raise it to 180, 200, or what? what? At nope. a minimum mm -hmm. for the third time. Okay, second thing, uh, I, I believe that this whole discussion is happening because we heard from a woman who happens to be my neighbor. Uh, she's viciously attacked. So let's go back to that situation. The dog attacked her. What level was her wound on the Dunbar scale? I would have to review her case to see um, where it fit on the Dunbar scale, and I haven't done that. Well, somebody did, though, correct? Or at some point there was a number given to her? We didn't use the Dunbar scale at that time. We're just now asking to implement that. So there was no scale used? Not this scale. Okay, so that's one thing, um, because I know she, was, she had several multiple wounds, so it probably would have been a level four. It might have been. Okay, so under under this new, uh, si with her, my understanding is that they were told to keep the dog in the house. He had to be muzzled. Correct. That's still going to be part of the, we're still going to have a muzzling? Yes, if they're still restricted. If they're deemed restricted then, and they can go back home, they would have to be muzzled if they went outside. Okay, so they're going to be muzzled. They're going to have the $100,000 insurance thing. Mm -hmm and there's gonna to have to be some signage. Correct. And that would be what level on the Dunbar scale? Three and Those above. would be three, probably threes, yeah. And, and who's gonna make the Dunbar scale? Is that a doctor who's gonna decide what number that is or is it you? We would examine are, that. Are you, you doing it? She's wondering if... Yeah, Keith Allenstein. Oh, if you, yeah, you know what office. followed our conversation there. Sorry. Yep, I did. Okay. Um, yeah, obviously, if, if we can do it, we will do that. Obviously, if the if the victim is is going into a doctor's office um, to get that treatment, stuff like that, we'll take whatever information we can get from them. Um, so uh, my, my guess is that, the, you know, and, but as far as then uh, measuring, if we have to measure, um, look at the dog's teeth and things like that, it's, it's going to be a any combination of people, but the medical profession. Before. Okay, so what level of the Dunbar scale makes it um, become a restricted dog? There is no level. Any any aggressive, um, even approaching an apparent attitude of attack could make it a restricted dog. So if a dog comes up and acts like it's going to attack you. Really? But doesn't actually inflict any injury, that under our present ordinance, that can be declared vicious as well as um, under this would be a restriction. So the dog doesn't have to bite. If a dog walks up, and we have people that get injured without getting bit all the time, they get scratched, um, they get knocked down, um, any number of things from a dog coming up. So biting is not always the only way that a person can get injured. So let's say, um, and I'm just trying to vet out all the, the possibilities. So s someone's coming, okay, I'm going to a, a friend's house who has a dog. I'm coming up to their door. I, it, and I go into their home and the dog bites me. That is going to make their dog become restricted. And then they're going to have to muzzle it, get the hundred thousand dollar. Get those numbers. Yeah. Um, not, not automatically. We don't, not every dog that bites gets declared. Um, we had 305 dog bites last year, um, approximately 10 declarations. So you, you've heard the saying, every dog gets one free bite. Every dog is what? One free bite. You've heard that saying? I've never heard never that. Heard that saying. One okay. free bite. Yeah, um, we don't we don't necessarily follow. I mean, we don't. That isn't the. That's a rule of thumb. It's kind of a saying that exists out there, uh, just for the proposition that just because a dog bites, doesn't mean that every situation, every time, we're going to declare it restricted or or presently vicious. We do not do that. We we look at the circumstances. Obviously, we can't do it um, if the dog's being tormented or teased or the, the person's an intruder. Um, we take into consideration whether the dog's on its own turf or whether it's off on somebody else's property. Uh, we take a look at all those things in making that determination. 
So like someone within their a residence, if I'm at a friend's house and their dog bites me, it's going to be less severe for that dog than if the dog runs across the street and bites me. All other things being equal, probably so. But if that dog, if you walk in and that dog mauls your two-year-old child and kills it, then it's going to be a vicious dog whether it's in your own house or not. Um, just because... Uh, if someone, people have to control their dogs in their own house, too. If they invite people in, their dogs can't just attack people. It's um, really so. a case-by-case case is what you're it, it is. referring it is. to. It is, certainly, and it always has been, and it will be from, from this point forward. So it's, we, look at, we look at each circumstance, history, um, all those types of things. Oh, how about the, and I know this, this I think might have, you might have discussed this in the past, but we're talking about after a dog is de de deemed restricted classification, then you have the $100,000. Would you ever, would we ever want to go to saying some breeds would merit having some insurance behind them just because of the vicious nature of their history? We can't do that by state statute. Um, state statute uh, within the last two or three years, I can't remember specifically, in fact, this council entertained that idea um, some, a number of years ago, and the state got wind of it and passed a statute that says no city shall pass any, any ordinance that uh, places any restriction, whether it be, and that would be a restriction, uh, based upon breed alone. So we cannot do that, even if we wanted to. That was when I was in the legislature and voted on it and had the whole debate. It was a quite contentious debate and quite controversial um, the hundreds and hundreds of emails we received from both sides of it, but it really, um, it, it wasn't unanimously, obviously, but it was supported, and that's, there's no municipality can restrict any breeds at all. I know there's some insurance companies um, that, as a, a landlord, they allow me to restrict restrict breeds on my rental property because it's my personal property, and so I can restrict it based on my insurance because if something happens, I, uh, my insurance won't cover it if it's a certain kind of breed and, and there's an issue. Um, and so I have that flexibility with my insurance company if I choose to exercise that. So uh, under what we're doing here, we'll take the case that, we're, that prompted this. Um, sh if, that ha if that replayed after we do this, the dog will be euthanized. After he gets to have a hearing. Right, he's going to have yeah. The, the under dog. either declaration, they have a hearing. They can have a hearing. But so that dog, because that dog was given some extra chances, and I thought there was a pregnancy thing involved with that. Right, that that's why we didn't. He was given a little extra Take time. Take it right away. It had it was pregnant and had pups, and yes, there were some concerns there uh, about certain things that we, like we couldn't require that it be that it be fixed um, while it's pregnant. Um, so there were some some procedures there. But I do want to make clear that, uh, you know, this, these ordinance changes aren't strictly because of one case. And I, I don't know, I have not looked back and I don't think Mr. Young's looked back and, uh, to see if, if, uh, Ms. Bailey's case would, would, uh, have qualified. It, it certainly may have, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look and I haven't done that. But, uh, but the, the, her case brought this back to the forefront, but it is something that we've been considering for some time. It just, it occurred to us, that there should be certain situations where there is an attack that is so bad that perhaps that person should not get their dog back, even if they agree to get a hundred thousand dollar policy. Because quite frankly, if the attack's bad enough, that hundred thousand dollars isn't going to cover their medical expenses that the person has. So, we, there's just certain situations where uh, we we think that it's no matter what the person does, perhaps they should not get that dog back. Right. And uh, one more thing. We have no restriction right now. Somebody can have the dog in their yard, and it doesn't have to be leashed or tied up. Is that correct? It can as, long be... as, as long as it stays in their yard, as soon as it touches the sidewalk, it is at large, and that is a violation. And I will say, I, I mean, I certainly want to have compassion for dogs, and I don't want to see any dog put down unnecessarily. But I also know that when I've been walking around, there are times I do feel afraid when you have dogs coming at you and no, no one in our community should have to deal with that. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Otherwise I have a couple. Um, I would be curious on the fine collections if there's a process in place and how many of them actually pay them or what they have to do. I mean, do I have to pay that $95 fine to get my dog back 
Or is it kind of like, um, here, we'll just keep racking this up and, and we're going to hold your dog until you pay it? How does, how does that process work? Yeah, that, that's a completely separate process. The clerk of court's office, because when a person gets a, a ticket for having their dog at large or whatever it is, um, that's handled through, through the court system. And so my office handles those prosecutions okay. uh, if they want a trial. Um, otherwise, the person can come in and pay the $95 um, or uh, agree to plea. Uh, whether they actually pay that or not um, is completely up to the state of South Dakota in collecting that. Um, so the state of South Dakota currently, depending on uh, whether there's payment or not, depend it depends on when the person doesn't pay. So if they just don't show up, a warrant will issue. If they show up and plead but don't pay, then it just goes to collections. And so that, that's all handled by the state of South Dakota. Because really, well, And the reason why I ask that is, is doubling it really going to make a difference? If, they're not, if I'm not going to pay $95, I'm not going to pay 100 and whatever. You know, I mean, so is it really making a difference or is it just adding to the bottom line of collections if it's enough to really deter people from doing the repeat? But... You know, three hundred dollars in a year is a, more than a lot of dogs cost, plus vaccinations and all of that. So you just kind of wonder: is it is it going to make the impact that we are hoping that people maybe pay attention and don't let their dogs? You know, I would agree that there's some that escape because um, they are just. You know, my dog when he his battery dies on his collar, boy, he's a free. He is gone. He is out because the battery died on the on his collar, and so he's free dog and off run in the neighborhood. And so, um, you know, we have to be careful of that, but that's my responsibility to make sure I'm checking that, you know, it's not obviously his. So I just would be um, curious if that's going to accomplish what, what we want, but I don't want to just focus on that either. Um, I'm curious how you know if it's declared a vicious dog in another city. I mean, is there a list that we share that we can figure that out or how does that work? Basically, there's no list, no. It would be nice if there was, uh, so we did have a heads up. Um, but in different cities, they will let you know. The Sheriff's Department will call the other city if they find out where they're moving to and let them know that there's a vicious dog that might be moving into the city. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Um, and then I know this was just focused on, on dogs um, there's no other restrictions for other animals anywhere in this ordinance or any of that. It's not included, I mean, in cats or... You c it could include cats, your stray cats. Um, it could be for the, for the um, running at large, could be stray cats. And then a vicious, could have a vicious cat too, yeah, unfortunately. There. Right. Um, well, thank you for putting this together. I know we can move on to our next topic. Oh, I have one, one more. more. Okay, uh, Councillor Selberg. Thank you. One quick question. What are repercussions for not paying your pet fines? I mean, if you, uh, do you keep the dog in question or cat or what do you? No, we can't. Again, that's all handled by the state. Um, the person, if, if we end up seizing the dog, then they have to pay those impound fees, stuff like that, before they can get it back out. But uh, as far as the fine portions and that, um, the repercussions are, again, Either a warrant goes out for that person's arrest in certain situations if they just don't show up to address the ticket at all, but, um, or if they do come in and address the ticket, get ordered to pay a fine and don't, just don't pay that. The state of South Dakota has uh, chosen to just send that to collections, and then the collection companies track, try to track these people down and collect on behalf of the state. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Councilor Staley. Uh, one more question. Um, on this uh, feeding of animals, which, by the way, I've been guilty of, helping out a uh, mother cat in my backyard with her kittens. So find me. Okay, so, <laughs> and speak, so is there a fine? I don't see anything. Are you going to be fining people for doing that? Yeah, it's, it would just fall under the general penalty, so it'd be, it would be a $95 ticket. I'm not doing it right now. Yeah, so <laughs> it, would, it would just be a, it would, it'd be a $95 ticket. Okay. And obviously... Um, have to catch people doing it. We have to, I mean, there's, there are a number of situations Ms. Young can, can attest to, I'm sure, that, uh, you know, we'll educate people on this. Um, certainly try to educate people first. And, but we have people that we try to encourage now to not do that, and they won't stop. And then so some people you have to encourage in other well, ways. But I will say that, I mean, we had an instance just recently where the kid, mother gave birth to the kittens in the backyard. We found homes for the kittens. It was a fabulous thing. And I have called animal control but one time when there was a family in my backyard. Cats like me, what could I say? But we, um, 
animal control wouldn't come and help help me with it. They said that's your problem. So I mean, that's it's like, well, they did. They were they. You don't come out and just trap, uh, you know, moms and babies. Apparently, you said I could do it, but and this was like ten years ago. Are you doing that now? I mean, if somebody has a, you come out and take care of the animals, yes. the cats. Yeah, we we would right now. We would drop off a trap and hopefully catch mom and the kittens, and then um, take them to. And take take care them of to them. the humane take society, yep. okay. and they'd be adopted out. One other thing I wanted to mention about uh, what we were talking about is feeding the stray animals. We haven't had um, an incident lately where one person was feeding the stray cats, um, really likes feeding the stray cats. They're, of course, stray cats are kind of wild. Um, and then the stray cats attacked the neighbor dog. Uh, just a little, you know, little pipsqueak dog, but the stray cats started attacking the little neighbor dog. You know, and in that situation, it's it's hard to control, and you don't know then if that, which wild cat is attacking the little dog, so you have to try and catch them all and test them all or put them all in quarantines um, just to make sure that the little dog isn't going to catch rabies or something. So uh, just another aspect of that. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. I know this is near and dear to my heart. I, my niece was attacked by a dog. Um, as well as my husband was. He's a realtor showing a house and attacked by a dog on the calf and didn't have shot records, so he did the rabies thing. And so um, I think this is very important, rabies shots, let me be clear. <laughs> I think this is very important that we address this, and I want it to be very clear that this is not about breed at all, that it's not a part of the conversation, never has been, cannot be, and that it's really just about making sure that we're protecting our, our friends and our neighbors of people that might not take very good care of their, their dogs. So thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next item. Um, and it's you guys again, so take it away. <laughs> this item is discussion on barking dog ordinance procedures. I actually asked, since we were already talking about dogs, I asked for this one to come and just understand the process. I've seen, um, just to give a little background, I've seen both sides of this issue from um, a neighbor who is was just so frustrated. Um, and had recordings but didn't make the call, didn't do a bark log, and just really the frustration in his voice. And I've seen the other side where um, somebody's been on the receiving end of bark logs and what that can do. And so the intent is not to, uh, my intent is not necessarily to have any changes right this minute, but to look at it, see if we need to tighten up something, see if it's too subjective, um, and just have that conversation of what it looks like if you've got a nuisance dog in the neighborhood. So Sure. Okay, so we'll talk about barking dogs. Um, we have an ordinance also in our animal control that is supposed to help control um, noise disturbances by barking dogs. It's called Disturbing the Peace. And it states that the owner or custodian of an animal shall not allow the animal to create a disturbance by making loud noises any time of the day or night. That's basically the component of that. Um, so what will happen with a, a barking dog? The, co um, the call will come in, somebody will complain um, to Metro, and then the animal control officer gets dispatched to it. Um, they get out there as soon as they can. Usually we have two to three officers on and they're running throughout the city. So it, it might take an hour or so for them to get to the house. And what they'll do when they get there is they park down the block, just like a house down. So they're not right in front of the house. If they're right in front of the house, that might cause the dogs to bark. And we don't want to inadvertently make the dogs bark. So they'll park about a house down or around the corner where they could hear. So they'll listen for about 15 minutes and determine if they hear any barking during that time period. Um, so they'll either hear the dog barking or they won't. But if we do have a complaint, then they leave a notice on the, um, the dog owner's door that says there's been a complaint about your dog barking. Um, please take measures to, to control us in the future. If they can make contact with the person, um, that the dog owner, they'll also try and do that. If there's a, a phone number, they can try and reach them at, or if they're at home, that's the best option. Many people don't even know that their dogs are barking. Um, and most of our calls are settled with just a notice on the door or a notice to the, the dog owner. In 2016, we had 1,163 barking dog calls that we went to. Um, only seven of those ended up in citations. So it's a very low number of people that actually get citations for it. One reason is um, 
or by the time the animal control officer gets there, often the dogs are back in the house, probably, and they don't hear the dog barking. Or if they do hear the dog barking a little bit, or it, they'll go and they, we like to start with giving the person a warning, letting them try and fix the issue first. Maybe the dog has free access outside through a doggy door. And while they're at work, they have no idea their dog is barking. So we like to give them notice, let them try and fix the issue themselves first um, before we cite them for anything. Um, let's see. If multiple complaints come in, but animal control still hasn't heard the barking, then the officers will advise the reporting party to fill out the barking dog log, which is on our website, and I believe I sent out to everybody before the meeting. The barking dog log is then filled out by the reporting party. He has to fill it, they have to fill it out for 48 hours and document all of the barks that they um, think are disturbing to them or loud. The, the log has to be signed uh, by a witness who does not live at that address, who has witnessed the barking. Um, so then the officer will go pick up the barking dog log. They bring it back to the law enforcement center, put a case together concerning the barking dog, and then I review the barking dog log to see if it looks like there's been excessive uh, like time frames or a lot of dogs barking for an extended time frame on their log. Um, if excessive no noise looks like it's occurring during their time frame, I will then send it up to the assistant city attorney, Keith Allenstein, for his review. If he then believes that, yes, there is something here, um, we'll go ahead, we'll interview more of the neighbors to see if they've also noticed the dogs barking, if they have any complaints. Um, and then an affidavit will be drawn up by the police department detective and then the dog owner um, has the opportunity to present their case in court. So there's a lot of steps along this process. I mean, if an animal control officer pulls up and they hear the dog barking, they can give them the citation. That's one step. But in this, with this barking dog log, there's a lot more steps um, and clearances that it has to go through before they get cited for it. Anyone in uh, the audience want to speak on this particular item? If not, I'll turn it over to the council. Any questions by council um, in regards to this process or anything anybody wants to add? Commentary? All right. Um, I, I have a couple questions, I guess, too. Um, I really get the fact that you have to do the barking log because dog can come in 10 minutes later or you know be gone and all of a sudden the owner comes in and lets them in the house and so that timeline is really interesting you can't always just just rely on a phone call and for you to come the the part that I, I struggle with a little bit is is the whole neighbor versus neighbor almost adage that is is created with this and I understand there's some frustration people work from home people work weird hours of the day and night, but in my, my definition of nuisance or disturbance and your definition and your tolerance may be really two different things. And that's what I struggle with a little bit as far as what that looks like and um, if that can be tightened up a little bit so we're not creating it. But based on your statistics um, with the citations and those going forward, it doesn't appear to be a really heavily used strategy. It's just kind of a worst case scenario type type thing is what I'm hearing. Um, it really is. It's a worst case scenario. And it's when these neighbors get to the point where they just don't have any other recourse and animal control isn't catching the dogs barking. Um, we've only had two of these logs go through in the last three years, two and a half to three years. Um, so that's very minimum number of, of these cases actually are brought forward with the barking dog log. Right. Thank you. Nothing else from the council? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Staley. Um, when someone has a problem with the barking dog, what, what are some of the uh, solutions they can do? An owner? Yes. 
One is, like I mentioned, if it's a dog that has free access to the outdoors, if it has that stimulation of, you know, kids playing in the backyard that it barks, you know, if you, figure, if you can figure out why your dog is barking, that's how you can fix it. So is the dog barking only when I'm on my deck um, or is the dog barking at squirrels? You know, if you have to try and keep it away from those things that make it bark. There's also the, um, the collars um, that work sometimes. I tried one on my dog and she just, she barked and then it zapped her and then she yelped and then it zapped her and so I, had, I didn't have very good luck with that, but some people do. They have really good luck, especially if it's one that they can control themselves rather than an automatic um, kind of collar. But just preventing them from being outside during the day is, is a really big step too. So then they can't see the other things to bark at. And we all know dogs are gonna bark because of dogs. I dogs mean, that's bark. That's the way it is. Yep. So. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank Appreciate you. it. And um, I guess I would uh, just back up to the first thing. What what are you, what are your intentions? Your next plans with um, the first ordinance as far as moving it forward? Do you ha have you gotten that far yet? I should say. With the with the vicious animal and yeah. those. Yeah. When um, you plan to bring it we're forward? We're prepared to do whichever. If if uh, this committee uh, thinks that we should take a look at some other things to add to it or retract from it, otherwise. Um, if this committee believes that it's ready to go to the full council, we're we're fine with that too. So whatever you'd like to do. So I'll just look, I know we don't take any formal votes, but I'll just kind of look and see if there's any head nodding that moving on to the council and if there's in, any adjustment in changes. So, um, well, I, I mean, we certainly could do an informational, but this really is in in lieu of that going through the committee, and then it, you'll have the presentation again at its first reading. So. I would say that the informational might not be needed, necessary, since we started in the committee, and then you'll have that, that time to continue to have the dialogue as we move forward. We've got a couple weeks anyways because we don't have a council meeting next week, so the earliest that you could bring it anyways would be July 5th for first reading, um, if that's what you choose to do. But I mean, I, I guess I don't see any huge objections from the council here of bringing it forward and, and going ahead and moving. I'm guessing that we'll have some feedback based on this um, committee meeting and, and hear from constituents as we're out and about over the next couple weeks. And so we'll certainly let you know what we're hearing as well. So right. thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, could yeah. I just make one quick uh, brief? Uh, sure. Uh, something that I noticed this afternoon. Um, at least twice during our meetings this afternoon between the informational and now is the uh, mention of uh, national associations and the importance of uh, networking with other professionals within our, our realm. And I just wanted to point out how important it is that uh, all of our groups, whether it's us as counselors uh, attending national and state organizations and our uh, staff as part of the city, um, a lot of these things are able to uh, look at what other communities do and bring a good solution to us as a, a community as well. So just uh, mentioning how important those uh, networking opportunities are. Thank you, all about collaboration and learning from what others are doing. Why create the wheel if we don't have to? Perfect, sounds good. Um, is there any open discussion um, from the committee members? Councilor Staley, did you? Oh, I saw your hand up, sorry. I wanted um, to talk with Keith. Okay, um, well, we'll get back, Keith, if you wanna hang tight, we'll finish here first. Um, any other open discussion from council? Okay, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Thank you so much.